Hi there, I'm Michael Voloshinovich here. You can find me via the social media links below and also on my website at VibrantShot.com. So in this video, we are going to be going through some of the new features of Capture One Pro version 20. And as you may have already noticed, we've skipped ahead a bunch of different versions. Uh, we were last at version 12 and we're now at version 20. And that's really just to kind of align the releases with the year they're being released in. So obviously next one you can probably expect to be 21, 22, and so on. So let's just dive right into the new features that we have here. So we'll start with a couple of interface related changes. Now, if you're um, familiar with Capture 112, none of this will be a huge surprise for you. It's very similar to Capture 112. There's nothing really drastic here. It's just little improvements that really do add up to quite a bit actually. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Capture One at all, be sure to check out my previous video on getting started with Capture One 12, because that will really kind of give you an intro to everything you need to know in Capture One. And then you can just use this one to supplement some of the new features. So the first thing that we're going to look at is, as you can see, the uh, interface is a little bit different in terms of icons. So, um, you know, with, with 12, some of the icons were a little bit different up at the top here and over here. But for the most part, uh, they're very similar, really intuitive, simple, and all the customization options are still the same. The other thing you may also notice is within the tool section, we do have this scrollable section now. We've got a pin section at the top and a scrollable section down below. And you can, uh, which is actually really nice because before we had this sort of accordion style where uh, if you ran out of space, it would collapse all of the different uh, tools and you'd have to jump back and forth and constantly have to expand and collapse. And it was just a little bit annoying if you're going back and forth between the tools. So this scrollable, I think, just uh, makes it a little bit easier to navigate your different tool options. Now, what you can also do is if you decide that you want something to be in the pin section, you can just click on this little three dotted icon and say move to pinned area, and that will lock it in and the rest will scroll, but that one won't. You can also bring it back by saying move tool to scrollable area, or you can just drag it and kind of uh, grab it and you know try and place it within there, and then it's back in within the scrollable area. So that's just a nice little change there. And one other thing that I really like uh, that was added in terms of interface was this select next when option. And that is, um, if you uncheck these, it kind of goes back to what we had by default, but you can check off either when it's star rated or it's color tagged or both, it's going to advance to the next image. So if I'm culling through my images and rating them, let's say I want to give that one a four, you can see that as I clicked four, it jumps to the next image. Let's say I give that one a five, jumps to the next image. Let's say I give this one a six, which I have mapped to the color yellow. Uh, because I have it set to select next when the color is tagged, it will also advance ahead and so on and so on. So it's really nice that you can kind of set that and uh, not have to, you know, give it a rating and then use your up and down arrows or left and right arrows to advance to the next one. It's all done with one keystroke. So that's just kind of one of those nice things that uh, help you to speed up your workflow. So those are kind of the two main things on the UI side and sort of navigation side. And in terms of uh, image editing, one of the things that I think is the nicest improvement is in the high dynamic range section. And this is a section that I do use quite often. And um, as you can see, we've now gotten it broken down into four different options as opposed to just two. We've got highlight shadow, which are as before. And then we've also got the whites and the blacks. So if you're familiar with Lightroom, this will probably be pretty familiar to you. And it's actually a really nice change because what I always found that is while highlight and shadow worked well, they worked a little bit too aggressively into the midtones. So what would happen is if I adjusted my uh, highlights, it would sort of flatten out the image a little bit. So let's go to uh, let's go to this image over here and look at the highlight end of things. So let's go ahead and just kind of zero that out. And I'm actually going to clone this variant. And now in this one here. If we, uh, let's go to our variant and I'm going to turn the highlights down. Now, one thing you'll also notice is before high dynamic range started at zero, but it started at zero on this end. And so you could only push it this way and that would increase the recovery of a highlight or the recovery of a shadow. You could never go in the opposite direction and actually add contrast through that. So now you actually can, and you have to kind of change the way you think about it because now what happens is if you move to the left, you're going to see that highlights go down. If you move to the right, you can see that it actually brightens. So before it was a little bit different. If you move to the right, it always recovered. Now, intuitively, anything, any movement to the right increases brightness and then uh, any movement to the left decreases it. So the same thing goes for shadows. If we go to uh, the left, you can see it's getting darker. And if we go to the right, you can see that it is recovering. 
So what we want to do is on this one, uh, as we can see, the shirt over here is rather blown out because we have a white shirt and that oftentimes happens where we don't see a lot of the detail within that shirt. So what we can do is let's try and recover some of this using highlight recovery. So we're kind of keep pushing it until we start to see some detail in this shirt. And you can see that, oh, I'm actually pushing it the wrong way. See, I'm getting kind of in the old mindset of Capture One where I'm moving to the right. And it's, again, a little bit of an adjustment there, but it all makes sense. Uh, so if I start pulling this back, let's say to minus 25, now I'm getting some detail in my shirt here, and that looks great. But overall, the whole image has started getting more flat. Now, if I go to this one and I instead use the white, so now we know we're going to go to the left here, and we similarly go to about minus 25, you can see that it really kind of retained a little bit more contrast in the image. And if we compare that here, you can kind of see uh, between the two different images that uh, this one has gotten a lot more flattened down. So this is the one where we took down highlights, and this is the one where we took down uh, just the whites. So if you look at the histogram, you can see that this one over here has flattened down the histogram overall is pushed more towards the midtown midtones whereas this one here uh, remains more within the highlights so what it did was it just recovered some of these really bright highlights but it didn't sort of flatten down the rest of the image in the process like the highlights on the face we still have a little bit more sort of a, a dynamic feel to the image and that's really evident I find in this particular image over here if I try and recover the shadows so let's go ahead and kind of reset that so you can see this is the original and again we're just going to clone this out and we're going to do something similar so on the shadow end we're going to brighten shadows by about 25 or so 20 i think is good enough so we can see some more detail and then we're going to do the same thing here we're going to go blacks and we're going to go 20 on the blacks so once again if we compare you can see that it really kind of washes out some of the you know the shadows that aren't quite dark they're just sort of dark ish and then ultimately your image ends up getting flattened and we can see that effect even more if we let's say we just take this shadow up to 30 and then go to this one here and we take blacks up to 30 as well so if we kind of look at those two you can see that this one really has gotten flattened down quite a bit whereas this one we brightened up some of those really dark blacks and we bought some more detail out in them but the whole image still you know retains a lot more contrast a lot more depth to it and you can really kind of see that if we just go to here, if we start sliding this, if you just look at the histogram over here, you can see that that movement uh, is really just this fine little bit over here. And as I'm moving that, you can just see the very end nudging. On the shadow end, though, if I start nudging, you can see that the whole block over here, midtones get pushed inwards as opposed to just the very sort of shadowy part that we have over here. So that is just, I think, a really nice tool. Like you could kind of do this before using uh, some of the layering tools. So we could create a luma range mask and then apply highlight and shadow recovery to our desired luma range. And that worked fine. That kind of got around the problem. But again, it was one extra step that you had to do. You know, you had to create the layers. The layers didn't always apply perfectly to other layers. If you had landscape and high and um, portrait images mixed, uh, those masks wouldn't always apply perfectly. So it's nice not to have to worry about the layers for this kind of thing. We can just sort of apply it in batch to a bunch of different images and still have it retain a nice contrast look so for me that is kind of one of the coolest features and I do like the fact that you can go both ways it just gives you the option to add a little bit of extra contrast in there without perhaps venturing to something like levels or curves another thing that is kind of nice and convenient is if we let's say grab this image over here and uh, I've already got some white recovery on this so you can see the original was uh, something like this and then I've kind of taken that down once again still retaining a lot of the contrast that's in the image but just recovering some of the detail within there and if we go into our color editor over here, let's just shrink this one down. In the basic color editor, you see that things have changed a little bit and we can actually adjust these colors by just sort of dragging some of these different ranges. So if we want to kind of alter what these ranges are, we can do that. And then they're just kind of broken down into simple colors. And what we can do is we can pick our color. Let's say we want to look at the blue that we have within the back here. So if we click down on that, what we can now do is actually move our mouse up and down. So if we move up and down, you can't really see the mouse right now, but I'm moving up and down. You can kind of see within the saturation slider that I'm taking saturation down by moving down and bringing it up as I move my mouse up. Similarly, what I can do is I can click down and go right to left, and that's going to change my hue value. So you can see it's going more kind of cyan now. And if I go to the right, it's now becoming more magenta. 
So that's kind of cool. And we can also right click and we can say, you know, that we want the hue adjustment to be vertical or whatever. We can customize that. We can also increase the sensitivity of it. And we can see that lightness can also be affected by holding down the alt key. So if we click down, hold down alt or option and we drag, we can see that the lightness is being adjusted as well. So holding down alt will affect the lightness. So that's just kind of a quick way that you can manipulate those colors without having to pick and then kind of move in through here. Just very quickly, you can go up and down, left and right, and uh, make some changes to those specific colors. Another subtle but useful change can be found in the crop tools. So let's go ahead and grab a different image here. We're going to hit C for the crop tool and you can immediately see the difference. We've got these nice handles in the corners uh, and we've got handles in the middle. So we can just kind of grab that. Now if we, for example, don't have this constraint. So if we go into our, let's make sure that we've got the tool tab for composition. And then we have our ratio as unconstrained. We can see that we can just grab kind of in the middle and size that up. We can also obviously hold down shift and that will keep our crop ratio the same. And you can grab from here. And if you hold down option or alt, it will kind of you know reduce it down from both ends in a similar manner. So it's just a little bit easier to kind of manipulate the crop. Whereas before it was sometimes tricky to grab the corners and obviously you couldn't grab it from uh, bottom or top or right or left. It was only in the corners that you could grab it. And the other thing you can do is just hit the enter key now and it will apply that crop before you had to kind of jump back to uh, you know the hand tool or the pointer tool to get out of that crop interface. And as soon as you get back into it, you're right into this view where you can kind of see the whole image and all the different crop boundaries. So again, enter takes you right back to the drag tool. Now those are the main things and then just a couple of uh, little notable changes that we have as well is if we go into this image here for example and we go into our layers panel let's go ahead and create a couple of extra layers in here so we're just going to add a few so we've got three layers it doesn't really matter what the adjustments are within them what we can now do is we can copy those so if we can copy those adjustments into the clipboard we can actually specify which layers we copy over so before it was just like sort of a single item that says layers now we've got um, the option of selecting specifically which layers are copied so we can uh, let's say we want to you know apply just a color grading layer over we can do that by selecting the layer we want clicking copy and then applying it to our other images. So that's one thing there. And uh, another thing that has been improved a lot is the noise handling. So uh, I don't really have a good image to demonstrate that with because I don't shoot a ton of high ISO stuff, but uh, rest assured, I've seen a lot of different image comparisons and they are uh, much better now in 20 than they were in 12. And that's not to say it was bad in 12, but it really does help to retain a lot of the sharpness and a lot of the color information. And it just kind of makes that noise a lot more muted. So if you do a lot of high ISO work, uh, you will find that it looks much nicer with the new uh, Capture 120 engine than it did previously. And uh, one last thing to point out as well is uh, within the white balance tool, one thing that they fixed here was, uh, again, if you had a noisy image and you kind of click down on white balance, like let's say we wanted to balance on, uh, that's somewhere right here, actually. Well, let's make sure that first of all that we uh, balance on our background layer, not on our layer. So if we click there, you know, this is kind of zeroing out all the, the yellow warm light that I had. Before what happened was that oftentimes we'd have to kind of click around all over the place to try and get a couple of different areas to see which one was best because uh, even, you know, if there was a spot of noise in there, it would throw off the interpretation of the white balance sample at that point. It would really kind of do more of like a pixel point interpretation as opposed to a slightly more global one of that area. And so now they have fixed that and it actually is a little bit more intuitive, a little bit easier to sort of, um, you know, white balance sample off of some sort of reference uh, gray or white area within your image. So that about wraps up all of the main changes that we have within this new version. The only other thing uh, to note is if you do use DNG a lot, apparently the support for DNGs has been improved as well. They weren't always looking the best in previous versions, but apparently now they are much better. So uh, if that's something that you do use a lot, make sure you check that out in the new version. But overall, as I said, it's not a drastic change. It's not one where you know you have to completely relearn Capture One. It's just a few improvements in some key areas that I think, again, do add up to a much nicer product. And it is, again, going to help those people that are coming off of Lightroom and are you know used to having, uh, especially this high dynamic range area go plus minus and also having the ability to control those whites and blacks separate from highlights and shadows, as well as the crop tool, being able to hit enter and having it apply that crop tool. So if you did find this video helpful, make sure you give me a like down below for it and also subscribe to my YouTube channel so that you get future updates just like this one. Bye for now.